Hello, smart people, and welcome to AI Master's Voice, your gateway to the growing world of artificial intelligence. AI is like water, it's everywhere. And how can we creatively deploy AI in the ways that create lasting value for users? I'm Martin Jokob, founder of AI Master's Agency and your guide on this journey. This podcast brings brilliant minds from around the globe shaping AI to your screens, breaking down complex ideas into something everyone can grasp. Whether you're in the field of just starting out or simply curious about AI, this is the place to explore its future impacts, ethical debates, and innovative applications. Before we start, here's a very important request to you. Yes, you. If you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do it now and click that bell button to get notifications about the new episodes of AI Master Source. And I'm more than amazed that we already have more than 1,000 subscribers. You guys and girls rock. My deepest respect to you all. So, what you can expect in this today's episode? We will dive into the essential dialogue on the five level of AI integration in business, a topic inspired by an insightful article on nfx.com and my guest that I will introduce to you shortly. By the way, the link to the article you will find in the video description. Today we are going to review the evolution of companies through the lens of AI integration, starting from basic enhancements to being fundamentally AI first. This journey not only highlights the transformative power of AI, but also showcases the diverse strategies companies adopt to harness this technology. This discussion isn't just academic, it's about understanding where AI is now and where it's headed next. And my guest today is Alex Honchar, a true pioneer in the AI landscape and CTO of Neurons Lab. And his journey from a curious youngster to a leader in AI is filled with challenges, learnings and innovations. From personal AI projects to over 50 completed with Neurons Lab. Alex has not only seen an, the spectrum of AI's impact and potential, but also was the one who pioneered the way. So Alex, it's great to have you here. Martin, thank you for inviting. Thank you for such a great intro. I think uh, not so many people call me a pioneer, so it's really flattering. Hope it's true, at least to some extent. From everything we talked previously and from everything I saw in your workshops and webinars, I believe you are the pioneer. Where I would like to start before we unpack the five levels of AI applications, let's explore your path. And Alex, can you share your story of your first encounter with AI? What drew you into AI field? I think I'll start the story from the kind of like very, very beginning. So my background before universities was purely in liberal, liberal art. So I was in the school, I was studying languages. I wasn't that good in mathematics, but since I was born in Ukraine and it's maybe not the best place to work in, let's say, liberal arts or languages, say the environment, the family members are pushing a little bit more, more to engineering technical work. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go and study applied mathematics in university. Actually, my parents, they're not engineers. Oh. One of my grandparents from mother's side is an engineer and also oh. there are other engineers on my mother's side, but my parents have nothing to do with engineering. It's teaching. My father was an actor as his first profession, so slightly different things. Okay, and, and you started studying mathematics. Yeah, and I was really bad at this. So basically the whole first year at university, I was almost out because I couldn't pass some exam. Why I'm telling this? Because that actually made me ask the question what mathematicians are doing. Because just studying books, it's like I couldn't find simply motivation into it. So I was Googling what how mathematics is actually applied in different fields. I found robotics, computer vision, also machine learning. And that's how I started. And basically kind of like understanding where all these formulas are applied to some interesting things. I finally started to study well. I found my first couple of projects quickly. And that's basically it was 2012, 13, when it all really started. And how old you were at that moment when you find this? 19, 20, something like this. Uh, okay. yeah. not, not usual thing for a young person. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, depends to who you compare with, but I guess on average, yeah. <laughs> so you started studying and uh, how everything evolved? Since uh, I started already more than 10 years ago and now so many things changed. I would say if, if you want me to summarize the change for me as the expert is when I started, it was mathematics. So it was almost scientific area to do AI. It was research, papers, academia, etc. 
Right now, it's engineering and entrepreneurship, which is different. Let's, let's put it like this. Okay, but, but you also, in this field, you're trying to find out your place and your way in, in, in this field. I mean, I'm doing all three, but it, uh, it's a spectrum. And recently, yeah. I have to do much less of the real scientific work. It's much more of the engineering and finding the creative industrial applications, which basically entrepreneurship, how to find the application, how to convince people, how to sell, how to deliver, how to make the business impact. Much less about mathematics today. Uh, so, so basically convincing ago. people how to apply AI in their business processes and etc. I would say convincing is a bit tough word, explaining, motivating, okay. showing the benefits. Yeah, I agree on this. You were involved in more than 60 AI projects combined. And I don't know, maybe more, but at least the number you, you told me previously, it was more than 60. The so time flies you... fast. I think okay. 60 is only in neuron slab. I think it's already... Reflecting on this, uh, what was the most challenging aspect and how did you overcome it? Could you highlight maybe the one project would stand out to you personally and what made it significant? It always comes down to data and mm -hmm. it always really hard when it comes to the physical world. And so basically when we talk about the digital application, something that happens on the internet, like uh, with the recommend recommender systems, some predictions, some uh, fun, it's always easy. But when I talk, I want to talk about the two projects. One I was involved in personally, and second neuron slab. Okay. So my pers personal project was many years ago, it was related to cardiography and okay. using variable devices. I was working with guys who manufactured their own cardiography device and we obviously had to go and collect the data. And it re you really need to understand details. So such details that people who have, let's say, more sweaty hands or more hairy hands, their data and recording will be really different. Okay. So when you work on collect the data, you need to know what kind of people, literally how they sweat, how hairy are their hands, how they are moving, how far their phone is from the device itself. Data part, data collection is really crucial. So this is what I encountered myself as the engineer. And uh, then at Neurons Lab, we had project related to the ship industry that we discussed before. And our client was Singapore company, Cordex. And they did a good job on the collecting the data, streaming it from the seas, from the oceans. But then the challenge is it's not that a lot of data because there are not so many ships who are actually digitalizing. So when you have really little data from a domain that is really not common, so you cannot find it in open source, you can't really find it in papers, you cannot find some you know free machine learning models, you have to be really creative. So both in cardiography, and both in the ship uh, exercise, we had to do actually combine mathematical modeling, really come up with the first principles and some kind of data-driven learning. Today, there is a coined term, it's called physics-informed machine learning. When you combine, when basically the idea is when there is not enough data, because when you deal with the hardware, like you, there is not enough patients with such, with some disease who are ready to give you data. In the world, there are not so many ships that are digitalized. So when there is not enough data, like on the internet scale, you actually have to combine some machine learning things with, you know, traditional physical modeling. Because we went to the moon, without machine learning. That's favorite example, <laughs> just with mathematics. So we keep doing the same. And this is the, the main thing. I'm um, finding out this often, even today, I had some conversation, like some potential clients said, oh, show me the examples of, of the projects. And I said, okay, what exactly you want to achieve? Oh, I want to do that, 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 and that. I said, yeah, that's great. But do you have a data? How are you doing this at the moment? No. So without the data and without knowing how exactly you're trying to achieve in your current environment, we need to start collecting it. We need to start labeling it. So we need to start setting it into data sets and preparing it. Oh no, I thought AI will solve all my problems by just by saying it doesn't work like this. <laughs> I understand what at the moment, just correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you said you are working like in three directions, like explaining to entrepreneurs how to apply AI in their daily work. Uh, you will work in scientific field and also in the business field itself. What's happening and where people should start and where AI projects start? And you, you already have some, some of the, your experience in doing this. Yeah, and I think we are slowly coming up to the main topic of our discussion, this uh, five levels that we advertised. The first level starts basically exactly over here, where to start. Exactly, because today let's discuss the modern version, how to start. There is a very traditional version like, oh, you know, you need to collect the data, etc., etc. And this is still very true. 
Mm-hmm. But today, basically, what we can consider is how to start. There are so many available tools. Okay. Basically, and they didn't for, exist when you started, for example. Exactly. Exactly. So right now, and I'm not talking only about the you know popular chatbots or popular open source solutions. And I'm not talking all, and they're available for the text, for the audio, for the video, uh, even for molecular data, for some physical data, for data of you know some sales, let's say in e-commerce on uh, retail. There are many models that are already, or even products that are available for, let's say, adequate price that you can try really quick. Basically, this is the level one. When entrepreneurs are coming to me and asking, how can I apply AI? Even if, let's say, it's my interest to start selling them the services of developing from scratch, but mm-hmm. in their interest is to try to use those ready tools. If they, especially if it's a digital world, especially if it's sales, marketing, some kind of analytics, uh, agents, automation, just so many tools. The level one, do you think it's really important to understand what exactly you are trying to achieve? Or you can just open some of the AI tools and just try to figure out how and where you will apply it? Or it's better to have at least some small plan? There's a separate issue of the, let's say, business acumen and the business understanding because I assume that the managers who want to apply AI, it doesn't matter in what domains, operations, it's marketing, it's sales, it's, you know, whatever it is, they have some processes in hand, handbooks, metrics, OKRs, KPIs that they measure and track. And if for example, have, say they, if they have. well, exactly, that, that's a very big assumption. And this is what yeah. I want to say that if they say have it and they mm-hmm. say, okay, so I want to increase my conversions yeah. and I identify that I, that my clients don't, leads don't convert well because of lack of the personalization. And trust this me. is the case we can discuss here. You can start with chat GPT, with yeah. Cloud, with whatever you like, with Gemini with Mistral, because you can already start personalizing your messages, your campaign. Because you know chatbots. what you want to achieve. You already Exactly, know. because you know this This is my target. This is yeah. my bottleneck. This is my problem. Personalization, I'm attacking it. Or yeah. for example, it takes me too much time to generate some reports. And that's why you know, I'm slow to go to market and lose opportunities, etc. Okay, so I want to speed up report generation. You Google AI for report generation, AI for presentation generation. There are like 20 tools like this. Yeah, and if you and, even don't yeah. know what tool to use, ask ChatGPT what tools are on the market. For... Or just try. Yeah, or... Just yeah. try. They're, they're, they're all intuitive. It's like today you just write a prompt. I want to create a presentation for this, 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 this. And I want it to include this, 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 this. This is the client who I'm preparing the presentation for. You know, people just need to try. And it costs like, what, 20, 30 bucks per month? Come on. I still heard, oh, are you using the paid version? Yeah, it's $20. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, if you're not comparing the models, maybe it looks like good enough. But if you would try the paid versions, they are just faster. They are just doing exactly. be- better work. They understand more data. Sometimes anyway, they hallucinate. You need to start. Even ChatGPT has, especially on the phone, this voice option. Yeah. Just talk to it. Just like with the human. Like, hey, I want to do this and I'm trying to do that and try to hear what it says. Try to imagine like you're talking with person, you're asking the person questions and you're getting answers. And of course, if your questions are <laughs> really low level, you will get low level answers. That's try to learn how to ask better questions. 100%. And again, we are coming to the way if you really understand the field you're working in, if you, because if you understand, you can ask the right questions and yeah. the way you can structure information, because if you have some kind of uh, tables or bullet points or some kind of hierarchy, you can basically feed it your favorite chatbot and to understand it better. So again, we are coming, if you are as a human understanding what you're doing, you can use any, and I'm saying literally any AI tool and it will help you. So at, at the first level, you say to start it, it's enough just to use the tools that are on the market, try it, play with them talk with them, chat with them, express what you want, try to get some results and and see how it works. So may, maybe in a level, at level one, there is something more. I would say this is bare minimum. So basically when the question is, how do I start? I don't see any better start right now. I mean, of course there are some deviations. For example, you can, if you really want it, you can start with something a little bit more advanced. For example, major cloud providers like AWS, uh, Google Cloud, and Microsoft Azure, they have a little bit more complicated tools that and more specialized. For example, for documents processing, OCR, or something with the translations, you can use that. But still, it's uh, okay. It's not as easy as to send a voice message to ChatGPT. Yeah. But if you are a little bit more technical, this definitely can be helped. I think where, where the switch is coming in when we are trying to scale this effect. So everything we discussed right on level one, 
one person, maybe two people having their own accounts, generating pictures, text tables, working well. And let's say you have a team of 50 people or 100 people, but the budget for your department or your team is already high and yeah. you expect higher return on investment. So yeah. this is already where we come to the next level. Can we call the level one as AI enhanced companies who are trying to use uh, some tools and trying to you know, leverage and get some jobs done with AI tools? In the level two, AI products extension phase, companies use AI to better meet customer needs and uncover new opportunities, all without shifting their business solely to AI, but just using AI. So what are the key characteristics of AI product extensions compared from, to the previous level, level one, and how they differentiate from the AI enhanced company? I would say that, and again, for example, the structure we're using is coming from the NFX Venture Fund, and my interpretation is slightly different. Why? Because NFX Fund, they focus on the startup. Yeah. So their fire levels is basically how they build your product. I'm trying to talk a little bit more on the broader level, so how to apply to any kind of company, mm -hmm. even that potentially traditional not businesses digital. and as such. Yeah, exactly. Not like digital startup products. With this level of abstraction, level two is when you want to already enhance a team internally or a whole cohort of clients externally. So this is where the switch is coming in. If on level one, it's a one person who's in charge of yeah. And you know, this person doesn't share the prompts, doesn't share the results. It's just like, okay, I can generate some tables fast. So I can do 50% more work in the same hours. I mean, one person can do it, two people can do it. But when you talk about the team of 20, 50, 100 people, 1,000 people, what matters? First of all, the collaboration. Yeah. They cannot just copy paste the results in the team. Yeah. Second, you need to ensure the repeatability and consistency of the outputs. So if one person using ChatGPT in some specific way or any other tool, it means other people want to have the, same, to have approach. the same result. So basically, they need some, you need to enforce some system. And with such big teams already, you have much more metrics. You have some KPIs, the speed, the efficacy, the cost of your department, and you track your results already much more strictly. So typically what we see in, I would say, in more traditional business. This is the stage when you want to replace some kind of external tool with simple internal platform. So I'm giving an example for, let's say, even for marketing. One, one or two experts can use any kind of chat tool, let's say, to personalize the texts for the audience. Okay. And when it's the marketing team of 100 people, we need to ensure the same tone of voice, the same messaging, the same Branding keywords, message. the same yeah. the same references, etc., etc. So basically what we do, instead of using, let's say, ChatGPT or Anthropic Cloud as chatbot interface, we use their API. We build a very simple platform, which is corporate platform on corporate domain, where that corporate data is protected, by the way, for majority of clients, especially in Europe, is very important. So you have your own server, your own simple platform that looks the same as a chat, but you can see how your team members are working and the context is shared. So the rules are shared, the reference documents are shared. There is a library of the prompts and messages that you can reuse. And for example, if I found a good combination, I add it to this library so others can... And then the metrics are tracked. Yeah, so, so we basically track how... the knowledge base always updated and everyone yeah. who is just working today, they're getting the newest, the best version of everything yeah. what is inside the knowledge exactly. base. Exactly. Yeah. So technologically, it's very simple. Even the users, they have really similar experience. I'm chatting to a chat. Just now it's a corporate platform with the corporate data, but technologically and interfacially, almost the same very simple. so you, you're using some open source llms run on uh, internal servers or some cloud servers to, this is how you deliver the information and using the practically AI. basically if the company has some custom made solutions basically they are at the second level of course if they are employees and all the management using these tools because one thing is to have a tool another thing is to use that tool sometimes i'm finding out especially when i'm talking about digital ecosystem even before ai become a thing in the public people didn't know what they are buying especially bigger companies i'm saying do you have this oh yeah we bought this software okay who is using that software daily Mm -hmm. nobody do you know how to use it no how much you're paying few thousand <laughs> here is the same like if you have some ai solution you need to use it daily and you need to know how to use it can we go to the next level what do you think yeah of course so what is the ne next level of complexity yeah so let's say we're on the level two we already have some platform yeah the prompts are shared and teams are using it how do you actually make it better 
how do you make it your important IP? How do you make it as a, let's say, a part of the capitalization of your company? Here is where we come to the traditional machine learning. So this is when you, all the data that you use in the process. So at this stage, most probably you already have a, like a dashboard, formal process, metrics, inputs, outputs, mistakes, but you don't do anything with it. So you collect this data, you use AI, but you don't improve your AI. So the level three is when you can keep the same system, the same interface, but you start improving your algorithm, typically by fine tuning to create your own model. So let's say you, again, marketing, personalization, etc. but let's say you're working some specific domain like energy and you yeah. sell some batteries yeah. and you see that uh, you can personalize it, but your model is not that good with technical jargon, maybe because you sell to other engineers who work in maintenance, I don't know. And you see that when the customer satisfaction is low, it's when your neural network is given, let's say, doesn't speak with the jargon. So what you need to do, you need to take the examples when you speak uh, appropriately, fine tune the model, and this model starts speaking correctly, your metrics increase. And what basically what is the outcome here? It's not only the process around it, but you came up with a new unique model that is straight on your unique data, your unique questions, unique answers, unique mistakes. And this is already becoming your real competitor advantage. Because look on the level, on the previous level, you use the same GPT or Claude just kind of equalize for everyone. Yeah, it's on the level three. Model. Yeah. Yeah, on the level three, it's your model with your own data that is all, always fitting to your mistakes and your successes. Mm -hmm. And again, not everyone even has to go to this level. But when you, let's say, already consider that, okay, I really want to have AI-powered marketing or I want to have AI-powered analytics, you have to train the model. You need to have your own model tailored to your data, to your clients, to your, again, mistakes and uh, success cases. And you know, I, I hear this uh, saying at least a few times a month, like, oh, we will wait for the better AI. And from what I hearing here, like better AI, I'm not sure what they have in mind. The AI, what will read their minds and, <laughs> and somehow start to work somehow in their own companies. But what I'm hearing from you, you are saying what the main thing to make AI work for you, you need to have your own data. You need to have something to feed AI so it can start understand what's going on in the business and uh, talking about this how do you think companies can come up with the new ideas and products based on what they already know and gather it in their data sets maybe you have some examples even on, on this again those ideas are often coming from those levels so when this data collection is happening I mean, how typically entrepreneurship is happening? You talking to the clients or potential clients or some kind of audience and you hear the pain points and you're like, okay, I have a solution for this pain point. This is basically how you create a business. And let's say traditionally without AI, you work in batteries and energy and you sell batteries as some kind of maintenance. I don't know. You're talking to your customers, they complain about, let's say, the battery duration or wear out. Yeah. And now you can say, okay, how? and you have many clients like this. So you can think, I can solve it technologically. I can engineer better batteries. I can solve it from the software perspective. I can install some sensors to the battery racks. I can measure the deterioration and replace them accordingly. Or let's say I can solve it from the education perspective. I can teach people how to use batteries better so they last 20% longer. You see many different solutions. And AI here is coming as, again, just one of the potential ideas. And basically we are slowly coming to the level four. What is in the level four or that level is called AI is the product? Uh, AI itself becomes the central offering, solving significant problems in traditional industries through innovative applications. Exactly. I want to share with you an example of one of our clients. It's a company, Peak Defense. And basically okay. what they deal with, they do cybersecurity management services. Okay. It's relatively traditional business, similar to consulting. They are experts in cybersecurity, so they know about the procedures, about certifications, ISO, etc., etc. So when other clients are coming to them, with their documentation, processes, infrastructure, they can go through the handbook, do due diligence, and help them to improve their cybersecurity in the company. And so you can imagine a lot of processes basically checking the documentation, checking the processes, checking the infrastructures due to some specific rules. Yeah, and finding and out what's company... working and what's not, or what doesn't exist at all. So. Exactly. So basically, when you already have such rules, such data, such examples, and basically this is what we help Peak Defense to do, is to create the AI, and you just throw to it documentation. On the back end, it checks the rules, checks the examples, does the score, and gives the out. So basically, this is when AI is becoming the product. Instead of selling the human work and human expertise, you sell your AI model, AI ecosystem that is trained on this expertise. Okay. And you see, this is basically 
change the value proposition because now you can do the scoring fast. You can serve more customers. It doesn't rely on the human mistakes or human talent or something like that. Of course, you still need human in the loop to, let's say, to double check. Or at least for, for some period of time. Yeah. But you see the, how what the company is selling is changing. Yeah. Instead of, oh, we have, we have a team that in a couple of weeks will do due diligence to we have an AI who will do due diligence in 30 seconds. Yeah. So basically, this is level four. AI is becoming mm -hmm. the, basically the product. Instead yeah. of selling the management, you sell the AI model that does those, this output. It's, it's really similar to what we have in the process and building at the moment when we got a new lead coming to our agency asking, oh, we need to, to do something with AI. We have the questionnaire, they answer the questionnaire, we're automatically pushing those answers in the background to our custom created uh, AI and uh, it analyzes and gives us answer what we need to do and where the main problems and even sort everything one by one so we can start saying hey you're having not AI problem but it's a process problem or maybe it's automation problem or maybe something else of course they are not very happy like oh we wanted AI not uh, something else but this is what you need to solve first and then we can try to implement if it's necessary because sometimes people are expecting from AI too much or they're expecting some magic what it will happen and this is where you need to you know to control their expectations so oh yeah <laughs> that's for sure basically ai becomes a product and maybe you in your uh, company you have some products what you are selling mass products uh, what you're already pre presenting as ai solution not yet so basically we are in the process of uh, some kind of evolution so mm -hmm. working with so many projects we found some patterns but you see, if you talk about the spectrum from pure consulting work, doing things from scratch and software as a service, we are only moving to, to another direction. So okay. of course, right now, when a new client is coming and it's a project we did five times, we don't tell them, oh, it's going to take a couple of months because you need to do things from scratch. No, of course, because we have organized knowledge, we have organized pipelines, okay, the process, uh, some templates. Is there, just like exactly. So, so we do it not in six weeks, but let's say in three weeks. But okay. it's not software as a service. But also it's not doing everything from scratch. I, I totally get it. And it's uh, different from the software creation business. People sometimes think it's a software creation business, but maybe you can say what's the difference between the software and AI based solution. I would say the main part is that uh, when you create a software is deterministic. So it's always going to behave as you programmed it, if you programmed it correctly. So if you, the button says print. It's supposed to, okay. but if it's AI bot that says like, okay, print me something, it might interpret it differently depending on the context. Basically, it's like and a smart button sitting there and understanding the context of what's happening and what it needs to do. Based exactly. Based yeah, on so the input data and uh, other context around. It. Yeah. So just what you said about managing expectations, uh, people need to understand that when there is the, the smart AI button, the results will be different from input to input from context to context it's important to also communicate the outputs properly and for even example, sometimes the, prepare yeah. the outputs direction so where you where, definitely where you want to go it was for definitely. me in the beginning it was really hard to explain like okay so what this ai solution will do i was saying it will help to direct people into that direction but it depends on a lot of variables what each personality will have and based on business variables based on pers persona variables and etc yep. i have no idea how it will deliver it but i know the person will be directed to the right direction and it's re it was really hard to explain and people trying to compare it to the software oh when i buy software i know what it will do and what it will give as an output i said yeah but you have like every new output you need to program personally here you can program the concept and it will deliver customized based on i don't know templates and preparation and data you want to to use yeah, you can please. even say that basically what these language models do they're some kind of proxy for reasoning so mm -hmm. when you do have traditional software it's programming when you add this at least language models they do some kind of reasoning of course it's really correlative reasoning it's reason in uh, in the parentheses, but uh, still, basically, if you're building a tool that needs to do some kind of reasoning on the visual, textual, audio, or video inputs, and it has to be not necessarily is deterministic, mm -hmm. then of course you can use uh, generative AI. But for example, if it's security application and you need to detect uh, weapons on the video stream, technically you can apply generative. But I would go with the traditional machine learning when you have a process, collect data, have some metrics, uh, train your own custom model. 
because uh, again, if you talk about the security, it's your kind of physical camera, the specific angles, in the specific rooms or outdoor. Also, most probably, who is coming, what kind of people, with what, how they are dressed, what kind of weapons you're looking for, and all this context matters. And also, how and you, you can, can connect that data with everything what you have internally and maybe recognize faces. I know what UAI yeah. Act kind of forbids that in some way, but it will be active in two years. But I know for the like police and special forces, it will be allowed to use that technology of to, to, yeah. to recognize people and compare them with their own databases. I mean, they already do that. So this is not nothing new. So basically, when you have a product, when the company has a product where AI can deliver value for the customers, it's a, le a level four company. They basically creating a service or products using yeah, AI yeah. and selling it. Yeah. So yeah. maybe we can move to the next level. Let's say the tip of AI integration at the level five is called AI first. And it means every aspect of the company operations and product offering relies on generative AI, paving the way for entirely new business models. Maybe you can give us some examples and what does it mean to be truly AI first? This is still emerging and there are not so many examples today. So for example, OpenAI is a great example. The okay. company, they even, all their products are AI products. So basically, it's AI first company. This company even cannot exist without AI. For example, if you talk about Amazon, Amazon has different AI services, but Amazon as a company can exist without. Yeah, they Microsoft have different AI income sources and products. But, exactly. Yeah. Apple. Apple can have Siri as a feature. Apple is a basically an electronics company that has some AI product. Okay. So basically, and you can enable, disable, and survive. But companies like OpenAI, like Anthropic, uh, like Mistral and other like emerging, they are creating basic. They produce AI models and AI infrastructures for other companies. And I think obviously we're gonna have more like this. For example, for images, a stable diffusion. For uh, videos, it's uh, run. Or Sora. Uh, Sora is AI product. Yeah. By AI first company, open AI. There are other companies on different levels from level one to four will somehow integrate or compete with their product. And uh, what advantages uh, or challenges like creating those companies? And I don't know, for me, <laughs> the one challenge is just what Sam Altman trying to do to raise 7 trillion, or he said maybe 8 trillion. So this is the first challenge. <laughs> you need a lot of money if you want to run similar company. I'm right, or maybe I'm wrong, or maybe there are other things what we can discuss. Well, to be fair, I never worked in such a company. Yeah. So basically my experience is coming from levels one to four. And this okay. is where is my focus and uh, let's say best fit of my application. Again, I'm not that great mathematician. For example, so this is one of the challenges. Com uh, companies from the level five, they need the greatest research to, to be able to create such novel models that completely, let's say, surpass the expectations. If, uh, let's say, my job is build the best model for some specific business case and this is where i need like business skills entrepreneurship skills etc etc those guys you know it's like uh, producing electricity or producing batteries if you can have a better battery you're always going to have a buyer it's like deep real deep tech if you have a better ai models right now people who are, who are going to so first of all is research inside in a way you don't need a market fit you just need to be the best in technology and of course being the best in technology is coming not only with the talent, also with computational resources, what you say. So a lot of money is needed uh, for that, for training, infrastructure, and uh, similar things. I was thinking, and you know, OpenAI could be a five, level five company even without the products, what they push outside. They can just sell to other companies what productize their creations. And sometimes some people, at least I'm from Lithuania and in Lithuania, they say, why we don't have these such a companies who create those models? I said, look, our country is too small and we don't have even those resources to even build something similar. I know one Lithuanian in, in Germany, he runs Aleph Alpha. He raised half a billion, I think as the first round to, to to make it happen and they are building uh, one of the models and i think they are level five count company i would say other businesses up to level four basically are users of level five companies products 
Uh, that's correct. And I just want to also say that level five companies, they can be non-profit or open source. Okay. For example, when some AI community releases a model for free, it's still, let's say, level five community, just that is not commercializing their work. So, but uh, I think it's still fair to fit them in that category. I don't remember the exact name, but this week, uh, one model kind of surpri surprised all the previous open sourced models. Maybe you. I also forgot the name. I saw the news, but I, yeah, I never read I, I news. I saw the uh, comparisons, and it just goes yeah. like, and you can just download it on Hugging Face and just run it on locally and have the best free model <laughs> locally compared to everything else what we have on the market. As our company, we are not trying to even pretend what we are level five company. No, we are using sometimes both level four and level five companies products and adapting it to the market or to our own purposes and needs. It's really interesting to, to see and understand at which level you are or which level you're trying to achieve. So Yeah, and be realistic about this. Yeah. Again, this, these levels are not good or bad. It's just like you need to know your capabilities. What is, uh, what is you trying to do? And if you're trying to make a startup real, don't, you, you don't need to be a level five. You even might not need to be level four. Yes. So just need and sometimes uh, you know if you want just to run locally something not as a product what you will sell to others but internally you will it's enough to be level two company and to have the product yep. inside of your company custom solution and use it okay yep. I hope to everyone who is listening it's more clearer how you can understand and start adapting and integrating AI in your business and understand what level you want to achieve and why. And it's really important why, because based on the level, your resources, what you will need, not only money resources, but also human resources, you will need to attract to make it happen. And if you want to achieve level four, level three, or level two, I think you can ask for help for companies like Neuron Labs, AI Masters Agency or and many, many others to help to create the custom solutions for you. Or if you're building a level three product where product itself is AI and when you want to sell to others, maybe it's, it's a good idea to partner with such a companies who already have the knowledge how to build these tools and help to build it much faster. Because I think experience is the really, really important thing here. And, you know, based on your experience working with more than 80 projects, I would like to ask you, you know, everyone likes to talk about uh, success cases. Yeah. But I believe uh, the most impact on companies, <laughs> you know, moving forward are the failures. And maybe you can tell to our audience one of the failure you cannot forget. <laughs> And it was the big, big, it helped you to make a big shift in your company and in your career. I'll tell you, I'll tell you even more. This uh, okay, mistake yeah. is, this mistake is public. So everyone can go and check it and laugh at me. Uh, and uh, what is interesting about, about this mistake that many people who you consider experts, they don't understand nothing about the field. So this okay. mistake is coming from my work in academia and okay. uh, when I was studying in Italy. And this is where I started working in the field of finance. And uh, it was first academical interest, and during which I wrote five or six papers that are published in peer-reviewed European uh, journals. So you can see there are people who actually read them, accept them, mm -hmm. and uh, they have many quotations. They have hundreds of quotations. So it was an like academic work. paper, yeah, what was publicly published. Yeah, yeah, it's all in public, so it's in respected European journals. Uh, people, you know, read them. Hundreds of people quote those papers, even more. But when you try to apply this work in uh, real finance, long story short, don't do this. You're going to lose a lot of money. And this is and the why? mistake I had to learn because uh, I did uh, mistakes that are related to the domain. I didn't really know how investment is working. Okay. And uh, for as an, I did as an academic exercise, basically in the sandbox, making uh, rookie mistakes from the finance perspective, finance data perspective, or fitting perspective, uh, uh, trades perspective, many things we... we you know, I need the whole complete another hour to talk about this. But the point is that uh, when I try to apply this approach with the clients, I really quickly learn with the money that that doesn't work, which of course made me reading authors like Marcus Lopez de Prado, 
learning about the correct financial approach, actually learning and buying, acquiring real financial data to see the difference between the sandbox and uh, yeah. and, re and real world. And I think what's notable about this mistake that it's all in public and uh, many people accepted this work as academically correct, oh. but uh, industrially it's completely incorrect. And this is a, you know, forever a reminder for me, basically, how we need to be careful with such so, things. So w w what you advise to others who are trying, you know, to follow some academic uh, research papers, what you would say to them? I don't know. I uh, Let's say I have a lot of respect for academia, let's, yeah. but this respect is uh, for the institutions, for people who dedicate themselves to science. But also academia, it's uh, very often not the same as business or industrial application. So no, there are many cool things that happen in the sandbox. And of course, often out of those sandbox, we have great uh, discoveries in physics, chemistry, whatever it is. For people who are, let's say, have academic background and mm -hmm. want to switch to business, I would recommend uh, not to be arrogant, how I was thinking that they, you know, I did some paper and I can do it all, but actually to go and make your hands dirty in the business. If it's, if it's in finance, go and place some trades on the real brokerage. If it's energy, go and install a battery into a battery rack. If it's uh, oil, go and visit the oil rig. If it's medicine, go and measure with the cardiography device your own body and body of the 10 patients. Get to know how the business is working. Get to know how the real field is working. And then when you get, let's say, to the hospital and measure the cardiograms, you then talk to the doctors talk to what they pay attention to, uh, talk to the patients, uh, discover how they feel about this, then go to the director of the hospital and what's important to the director because incentives of the director, of the doctor, of the patient can be completely different. So basically you need to know all the journey of the exactly. product application, let's say, and all the stakeholders who are using the product. Uh, otherwise, it can be just theoretically okay but in practice, it's just not working. Yeah. Maybe you want to add something more or on this example? There, there are minor things, you know, you don't clean the data well, or you plan for one test case, uh, and then uh, you go to the field and there are other people like this, the hairy and sweaty mm -hmm. people. But uh, all of them are a bit more part of the process. So of course okay. you learn something from it, but uh, they're not that you know, fundamental mistakes, process mistakes. Okay, and you, you said there are some other examples you want to share? Another mistake I can I can share with you is, the, let's say, a business mistake. So if you, maybe if someone follows our company for a while, uh, you might notice that uh, the way we position our website, our communication, etc., changed over time. And if you followed us, let's say, two years ago, you would notice that we have a lot of content and the website focused on the deep tech. Chemistry, physics, uh, biology, we are all PhDs, uh, doing science, we are even more scientists than engineers, etc. You know, it all sounds cool and sexy because we wanted to make a cool company that does impact to the world. We're going to do only energy and only healthcare projects because we are so impactful, blah, 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 blah. This is, I think, example of a business mistake when we put uh, some kind of ideology even before the data the business network, the available funds, the available talent, and there was a huge gap between what we actually could do and what we planned to do. And we were doing this for a couple of years, and unfortunately we didn't succeed a lot in working in this kind of cool deep tech projects. Yes, we have clients in energy. Yes, we have clients in healthcare, but we have many more clients in other domains. So yeah. a couple of years ago, we had to learn this lesson and started to, started to be you know, data-driven, market-driven. Of course, we have some aspirations, but also there is the reality. And for example, none of the co-founders is a real scientist. I'm not a real scientist. My co-founder is not a real scientist. We don't have real scientists on the team. So why do we even pretend you know, to be a scientist if this is not what we are doing? You, know? you, you mean the real scientist who has a scientific degree in university and uh, doing some projects, working on AI data, I'm not sure. Uh, Maybe. I'm a little bit harsh. For example, formally, I am also a scientist. You know, I have published academic papers. I was okay. a formal yeah, okay. so, contract so, professor so it, at university. Okay. Formally, I did all of this. Okay. Do I call myself a real scientist? No. Okay, okay. So, so you're shy. <laughs> you're trying no, to... no, no. I, we have some team members who I would consider real scientists who did the real impact on the in 
for example, even like in chemistry fields, yeah. or real impact who who published machine learning papers on the best machine learning conferences. Uh, those are the people who I can call real scientists. But the problem is that you can have such capabilities in the company, but it doesn't mean that uh, having one or two talents like this, you can go and say, look, we're going to help uh, Nova Nordisk to create a new drug. Mm -hmm. You know, th th this is the gap, a gap I'm talking about. In order to be able to help Nova Nordisk or to help Moderna or to help Pfizer to develop a new drug, you have to be on a whole next level, on a yeah. whole different level. It's kind of a level five, but in a bit different industry. Exactly. Connected exactly. with level five company who works in maybe AI sector. So then yeah. you can combine yeah. those two together. You can find, find out some mix or hybrid company and the product. All right. Thank you, Alex, for sharing everything. And today we took a trip through how AI is shaping businesses from small upgrades to a full AI-driven businesses. With Alex Hunter, we looked at what each stage is offering, its own sets of challenges and chances relieving how AI is revolutionizing business. Thank you, Alex, for joining us on AI Master's Voice. And maybe in the future, we can talk about different topics, maybe some specific case studies. Because one thing what I'm finding out really often, people asking, can you show the real case studies? Like this software does this in this company. Sometimes I also need to explain additional thing. This solution maybe works for this company, but that company has a data what is gathered for that company. And that company will never ever <laughs> give you that data. And until you have your own data, maybe you can use the same concept, but without the data, it won't work or until the data will reach the certain level, it will, won't work. And again, your process, your business is unique. It maybe yep. requires something new. But the adoption after you created one project, similar to what you need, is much easier and faster than the, the first one and pioneering. Thank you everyone for watching. And if you watched till now, click on the like button as it helps us to spread the message wider. It costs you just one click but it makes a huge impact on the community of AI enthusiasts and professionals. Uh, if you can, please share this episode with your colleagues and other AI communities. And do not hesitate to leave a comment under this video, ask questions or share additional examples if you think we missed something. For all the questions I believe both me and Alex will be answering if we see those questions. And don't forget to subscribe to AI Masters YouTube channel for more exciting conversations about the dynamic world of artificial intelligence. And until the next time, keep innovating. And thank you, Alex. Thank you, Martin, for inviting. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. Bye-bye.